Hello and welcome to the Audiobook Club. In this week's episode, we are so lucky to be joined by actor, director and audiobook narrator Matthew Lloyd-Davies. Matthew, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you today? I'm good, thanks. Thanks so much for asking. It's an absolute pleasure and a, a bit of a shock to be asked, to be honest. So it's lovely to be here. <laughs> so it's more than a pleasure to have you on. I'm so excited to chat to you. Um, on the show, we like to start off with a little bit of a self-introduction. Um, could you perhaps tell us a little about your background and how and when you found acting and audiobook narration and decided to pursue those as a career? Gosh, that's a big question to start <laughs> with. Okay, 37 years worth of answer coming up. Um, yeah, so I, I went to drama school in the late 80s, having kind of started in amateur theatre like we do and worked around that for a while, worked on the stage crew, stage management, got my equity card back when you had to do that. So I had to work quite hard to get into an industry that I saw as being something I wanted to do. Um, uh, the reason I wanted to do it, I can tell you, because I can remember to this day, um, we did a musical at school. So I would have been 15. It was just before I left school and I have quite a late birthday. So I was 15 playing Joseph in Joseph and the Amazing Technical Nice. Drivers. And um, well, I was only because I was the only boy in the choir. <laughs> so that, that was that's how that's how casting worked. Um, and there was a girl in our class called Ruth Pearson. And it's not that I didn't get on well with her, but we weren't mates. And dear Lord, God help you if you got on the wrong side of her. She had a tongue on her. Anyway, you know, everybody came to see the school shows. And I remember in the middle of one of the performances of Joseph, I heard Ruth's voice at the back of the hall going, go on, Matt. And I'm like, oh my God, Ruth Pearson is being nice to me. And I promise you that never left me. And I thought, oh, I, bet, I think I want to be an actor. People are nice to you. People like you when you do this. So that is kind of how I started that um, insecurity and vanity, um, probably. Um, sort of went <laughs> went on into uh, about 35 years of insecurity and vanity. That's what being an actor <laughs> probably is, isn't it? fear of missing out, insecurity, not feeling you're worthy and all of that. Um, anyway, uh, I went to drama school. I loved it. I I didn't, I haven't had a stellar career by any stretch of the imagination. I have been quite lucky. I've worked with some amazing directors. I've done a little bit of TV, a little bit of film, all quite good quality stuff, but mostly my career has been theatre which became musicals. Um, for some reason, I seem to get stuck in them. Um, and I wouldn't say it's because I'm a great singer by any stretch. I'm an actor who sings rather than a singer. Okay. Um, but that was what was wanted at the time. And just I've just kept going and I've just I just try to keep working hard. I love it. I love it so much um, that it kind of hurts sometimes to to, to watch and be a part of, of what goes on in the industry. I've been in shows where young actors have been treated appallingly. I've been in shows where I've been treated appallingly. And I've been in shows where I lost my patience and kind of started to realise I, di I, I didn't know if I really wanted to be that person doing that job anymore because it is hard and it is full of insecurity because you are constantly watched and judged and mm. you're what I think is sad about it, it's become an industry where you have to do as you were told. Mm. And, and and you go onto a website for a show and, it, and and you see the page that I always want to see who's in it. Cast and creatives, it says. So the cast being the people playing the roles and the creatives, the director and the designer and the lighting designer and the sound designer. And for me, that explains what exactly is wrong with the industry. They're all creatives, aren't they? All the actors are creating. What, what is this cast? You do as you're told and creatives. And it is kind of what's happened to the industry. And it, it makes me uncomfortable when I'm doing it. And I decided, therefore, to put my money where my mouth was and become one of the creatives. And I went back to drama school. I sold my flat to pay the fees to go back and do a master's in directing at the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School, which was the most extraordinary 18 months of my life in my 40s going back to university sort of thing um and was doing really well as a director but not getting paid very much it's even worse paid than being an actor which is which, that was a bit of a shock um but I think through doing the directing and becoming more um more established in my head the, the way I was thinking when I looked at a text I looked at it differently 
And I was still auditioning for acting. You just do whatever you, you do, whatever you can do in this industry to earn a living. And then I there was a there was an advert literally in the stage, you know, our our, our industry newspaper saying they wanted someone, you know, to audition for reading audio books. And I thought, well, I've always wanted to have a go at that. You know, I've always wanted to do the that the, the, there used to be a company that made books for the Royal National Institute for the Blind. And then it was literally that niche. But I always wanted to volunteer and do it. I could never get into it. So I thought, well, I'll audition. And I did. And they liked what I did. And they helped me sort my tech out a little bit. But on the whole, pretty appalling books. Um, mostly my fault, I should think. I had I knew nothing about what I was doing. I didn't know how to punch and roll. I didn't I I didn't even know how to get rid of the clicks between each little sample in the timeline. And I used to go through manually. So I'd, I'd record my whole bit, put it together and then go through manually putting in crossfades to get rid of the clicks until someone said to me once, just press command all, uh, command F and it will do it for you. And literally over within that one conversation, my life became my own again because I wasn't spending two, three hours a night yeah. individually putting in crossfades. And that's how I started um, in audio books. But again, it was... It was from the directing, really. It was from the approach to a text. It was from the way I now looked at the bigger picture and the minutiae at the same time and wasn't quite so concerned with, I don't know where to find my character because now I had to find 20 characters or yeah. 400 characters, whatever the book is. And um, and I just found that I loved it and 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 I kind of just sank into it. Pardon me, I just banged my own mic there. Such... <laughs> um, <laughs> And I just fell into it in, in that way. It, it, almost literally, I tripped over in, in a big hole of audio book and, and drowned in it and, and, and have really never looked back. It's, 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 a, it's a funny old job. It's something that a lot of people are trying to do. And you, you, it's sort of one of those jobs I think you can either do or you can't. You, you either mm. have that automatic connection with a text or you don't. Now, you can learn it and you can teach yourself to do it but it's hard to do that and if you're lucky enough to connect with a, a, a book like that then then I just say all you know all luck to you go for it and do it you know I think there's a there's a lot of conversation at the moment about training and coaching and background and oh oh you've never acted before well you can't do audiobooks or you're not getting training you can't do audiobooks or how many audiobooks do you listen to well if you don't listen to any you can't read them and I just think that everybody is their own voice and everybody's got their own mind and everybody's got their own technique and we should just embrace and let everybody come in and try it if that's what they want to do you know mm. the work will make the decision that the result and the product if if people aren't right for it they'll learn fairly quickly it's not for them it's hard graft mm. and um and i'm very proud that i'm still here um i'd love to say i'm still standing but of course i do it sitting down mostly but <laughs> it's 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 a hard job and one that i've just grown to love and adore more and more the more i do it and i'm extremely extraordinarily lucky that I get to do it full time yeah that's fantastic what a fantastic answer there's so much I need to unpack there um, <laughs> so one thing did stick out to me that do you think being a director coming into it as a director coming into audio narration you know off the back of being a director or as a director do you think that gave you a different perspective when starting to narrate audiobooks it gave me a different perspective I'm not saying that's right for everyone but, but as a director you're telling you do tend to more than as an actor, you do look at the whole story and the dynamic mm -hmm. and you just suddenly become aware as a director. When you're in a rehearsal room with 20 actors, you've got to be aware of what all 20 actors are doing, how they're interacting with each other, how mm -hmm. that crosses to that. Oh, my God, we've had this huge you know, energetic scene. I've got to bring it down or that character seems to be coming from stage right the whole time. This is getting very dull. It's the same when you're reading an audiobook. You know, if you can't just keep the same rhythms all the time, you can't keep the same energy all the time. You 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 have to search um for those moments when you can just twist it up a bit, shake it, make the listener listen. Mm. It's your 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 only job, your only job 
is to try and interpret what the author has written. That's that's all we do. That we don't do anything else. Anything else is ego. We've got to look at the text, whether that be the whole text, having prepped the whole book, and then at the chapter, having prepped the chapter, but then within the chapter, look at that page, that paragraph, that sentence. How is the sentence put together? What is the grammar? What is what is the use of commas? I've got one at the moment, and I know the author is basically using full stops quite often when they're meant to be commas. You work it out, you do the prep, you go, okay, that's how they write. Right, now I've got to be careful here because some of them will be full stops and some of them will be commas. And I've got to really, this is where the truth comes from. When I harp on in my coaching about truth, the truth for an audiobook narrator comes from, are we giving the author's truth? Are we truthfully reinterpreting black and white pixels on our screen into what the author was thinking when they wrote that down and that's our job and and in a way it couldn't be simpler it's that and yet mm. that's what makes it so huge and complex because it's an incredibly difficult thing to do you do have to do it within a finite amount of time otherwise you can't earn a living you can oh i just did an audition yesterday i sent to someone and i i, I just it was only a how long was the piece well they wanted two minutes and I, I couldn't stop. I had I had to go. No, I'm going to go to the end. I want to tell this story so I can make sure I've got the completely I've got the arch of what's going on here. And then I did it again. And then I did it again. So right, got to stop. I'm overthinking this now. Scrap those three. Went back to my right. Clear mind. Just read it. You know what the author is trying to do. So now just yeah. read it. And I can't. I can't describe what a satisfying feeling it is to get that right when I have to do it on my own I mean I have been directed and I do work in a studio sometimes and I produce I've just been producing for Penguin recently up in London but sitting in my booth that th there's no more satisfying feeling actually I was feeling it today a bit I was looking around going oh, I've just sort of been reconfiguring some of the um uh the acoustics because it wasn't it was I had a publisher saying oh god you've got a bit of reverb I was like, really and I completely inured yeah. to it by then. And so I've been resetting that, obviously, after finishing one book before starting another. And just the, the satisfaction you get of, A, being trusted, someone trusting you with their passion and their words, and then feeling when you send that, when you you, you send that to the publishers and think, yeah, I, I really think like I've I've got that. I really feel like I've found what they're trying to say. And it's wonderful. It's, it's a fantastic feeling. And yeah, it doesn't always work. And, you know, <laughs> days in there where I, I want to cut my own tongue out and, and <laughs> you know, but you have to beaver away and you have to, you have to find some self-belief and it's, you know, and that's where I guess why a lot of the um, forums and things on Facebook and all of those are very popular and, and incredibly helpful and supportive. And that's what I love or mm. have loved about them up until now there's so much support in this industry I, I i find it a little bit odd and extraordinary and mm. it, it isn't generally so through the acting certainly the theater industry certainly the musical industry that i've worked in mm. to be in an industry where people are looking for ways to support you to say nice things and to help you get through whatever it is you need to get through well you know and looking at the world as it is at the moment we all need that and, and we're very lucky to be surrounded by that and i i you know i guess that's kind of quite humbling every everybody you know i i've become friends with you know some of the the great and the good in this industry and i've become incredibly close friends with people who've literally just started and i've helped coach and i just see all these people as input to my thought processes and just literally my mental health and the way i feel when i get up in the morning yeah, I get that completely. And I've had very similar experiences, uh, especially with the, the kindness of this community and um, reaching, you know, Clubhouse is a great is a great one at the moment. Oh, I'll be on sure Clubhouse on Friday. I'm on on Friday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although I don't know when this is going out, so I might not be on Friday. You might have to cut that out. <laughs> um, this is going out on Friday, by the way, generally. Um, um, I'm clashing yeah. with me. <laughs> uh, but yeah clubhouse uh, especially for myself um recently has been uh, just a great sort of input for the community um talking about community in any industry but especially within acting and performing and, and audiobooks networking is such a vital part of growing in a professional capacity 
during your time learning the ropes as an assistant stage manager and then onto training at the Old Vic and through acting, did you specifically set out connecting with individuals whose work and profession stood out to you? Honestly, no. <laughs> I, honestly, no. And it's a shame. My, I would say this is a generational thing. My generation of actors, we went to drama school for two, three years. We didn't get a degree. We didn't get a diploma. You didn't get a piece of paper when you finished. You just finished. Mm -hmm. You spend two years utterly self-obsessed. You leave utterly self-obsessed mm. you do you get taught certainly bristol are incredibly good at teaching you to not network but boy did i write letters i think i i think i wrote about a thousand letters there's a book called contacts that has all the casting directors and all the producers and all the theater companies and they said to us right print your cv up write a, wrote to all of them but we weren't really taught about networking we weren't really well we didn't have we didn't have social we didn't have any social media, mm. of course. You know, we, we didn't have computer. No one had a computer. No one had a home computer. You know, the odd person had a Sinclair C5, was it? I think it was called a little funny thing that you plugged into your TV. So we weren't kind of, I don't know if sensitized is the right word. We weren't culturally sort of, it wasn't around us all the time. I mean, it is, you are, we are all constantly networking and careful of what we say and who we say it to. And it's a different, entirely different world, of course, now. Yeah. Um, so no, I didn't. I had an agent and I sat back and waited for the phone to ring to a certain mm. extent. I, I was one of the few who did. I, you know, Bristol teaches you sell yourself in that way. So I'd write letters, but I didn't do what a lot of people do. I didn't go to I didn't go to a show because I knew I'd meet people there or go for a drink afterwards because I knew I'd meet people in the pub after the show or things mm. like that. I think that's also a personality thing. I think and, and a lot of actors I know are like this, you know, we are gregarious and we love, I love actors company and I love being around actors, but I'm not, <laughs> this is going to sound totally disingenuous because I will not stop talking for the next two hours. <laughs> when you've left me, I'll still be here talking to myself. <laughs> I'm not brilliant in, um, in, in, I enjoy social situations, but I don't like them as much as others. And mm. I, I find myself working too hard. I'm probably doing it now. And um, because a lot of actors have to do that because you kind of get you're a little bit on your metal you're thinking about oh how am I going to sell myself you know I, I kind of got over that you know I have to watch that I don't swear too much but um apart from that I'm just like look here, here I am this is it you know you, you get what yeah. you see and I try to I try to give what I am but yeah. no I didn't and audio books have taught me yes I should and it is probably because of a, a, an, an audiobook reader from I think my first year doing audiobooks and I got to know her through a Facebook group and it turned out there weren't many British people so we connected and she said oh are you going to APAC and I was like I have no idea what you're talking about and she said well it's the Audio Publishers Association in America conference APAC and it's in New York I said well I doubt it you know I'm not spending thousands of pounds to go over there she goes you won't regret it if you do she said i went once and she said it i i paid for it within three weeks of coming home oh, so wow. she basically persuaded me to go to apac um not i didn't know anyone really in the industry over here um a couple of people her and i think just her and i was very lucky I got to do the ACX University, literally, I think it's second ever iteration. So it was a day at Audible. Mm. But the great and the good of Audible, it was extraordinary. And then I went to APAC and she was there and I was lucky to get a meeting with a producer and, and an audition. And then that led to you know, Audible asked me to record a book. And then I'd met someone, you literally just go around shoving your cards in people's hands and saying hello and I was one of the few Brits which made me a little less uninteresting maybe than others mm. and I found it incredibly difficult I yeah. sat on my own in a corner Billy no mates for quite a lot of it because I didn't know how to just go up and say hi um someone said that you're from Blackstone and uh, you know I'm new to the industry so I thought I'd just introduce myself and say that if you haven't got any British voices look I'm here so and then you can do that and then walk away again look I didn't want to interrupt your day so you've got my card you know where I am and that's what you do yeah um and now I don't mind doing that so much because I've that's what the publishers are there for that's what the producers are there for that's what the casting directors are there for as well um 
especially for the newbies you go i'm going again next year i've been it'll be my fifth time or sixth time and they want to meet new people they want to hear they want you to walk up and say hi didn't want to interrupt your conversation but here's my card this is you just give my one line this is what i can do and off you go i think my one line i uh, i imagine you've heard of simon vance mm -hmm. yeah yeah and he's like the great god of you know british audiobooks in in the states so on my card uh not last day pack the egg pack before the tagline on my card just said because simon vance can't do all the british audiobooks <laughs> And I was giving this out because people just thought this was hysterical. Yeah. And luckily, I do know Simon a bit. I'd met him at a function and I did show him the card. I said, is that all right? And he went, yeah, you're advertising me as well. So, <laughs> um, and, and it's just go over and be you, but don't mm. be overwhelmingly you. You know, mm. if that's, that's the only advice I'd give to that. But yeah, so that's a really <laughs> long way of saying I didn't, but I do now. Yeah, no, well, that's exactly, that's the sort of thing um, I was really interested in, actually, because this, um, I mean, not only for myself, but like, you know, the folks who I know listen to this show, and it's something that um, a lot of us, myself included, struggle with, uh, and I find myself being quite introverted. I think that's why um, uh, audiobooks sort of fit me quite well as a, you know, of my temperament, I guess. Um, but it's definitely something um, that myself and, and a few of the listeners are really trying to work on, really trying to, you know, because I don't know if it's like a British thing of like feeling rude just for interrupt, you know, because you sort of apologise just for existing. Yeah, I guess yeah. so it's maybe finding a balance between that and then not wanting to be over that, you know, you don't want to be that guy. It's very difficult. And I think there are, there are events that go on. And I think just sometimes just turn up at the first few and you might go again. Well, that was a waste of time. It wasn't a waste of time because, of course, next time you're going to be that much less uncomfortable. I won't say more comfortable. Mm. And it does build up. And then the fourth time you go, someone will go, oh, hello, I've seen you a few times. And you start chatting to someone and then you start feeling comfortable. And then it turns yeah. out the guy they're talking to is from Harper, UK. You know, yeah. I'm looking for new young voices or new old voices or new diverse voices or whatever it is. Yeah. And it's it is you you really have to push yourself. And as I say, I spent thousands of pounds. I went and was standing in there and I'm literally standing as a Billy No Mates. I mean, I was very, very lucky. I'd got, as I say, I got the, you know, meet a producer meeting and, and a couple of other things. So as far as I was concerned, I'd already that had made yeah. that had made the trip worthwhile and i promise you i have not done a trip where i haven't had an email at some stage in the next six months that paid for the trip not yeah. once and i think nearly everyone i know who goes um there's a little phalanx of us who go from the uk i think you'd get the same story from everyone because yeah. you you got it doesn't matter i mean i'm full-time i'm mm, I'm not turning work down because I'm lucky enough people go, all oh, right, we'll wait. So I'm booked up to the end of March now, next year, nice. yeah. um, which is lovely. But it it doesn't matter. I, I, I want it's not that I want more work. I want interesting work. I want work that is going to keep my mind alive. We all read books that we wouldn't normally read. And that's graft to yeah. make that interesting. Reading a book you, you, you wouldn't normally read. So, you know, if. I guess you could say I'm unlucky. I get a whole series of books I wouldn't read. I've got two series coming up of books I wouldn't read. So 10 books in a row. Yeah. And I'm alternating them. So I get two different styles. But what I've done is try to timetable them with the publisher who knows that they're all with the same publisher. So they're like, OK, you can, you know, diarise as you require. So I've left every two books. I leave a gap of a week. You never know what might come in. Well, I've already got one gap filled with a really good classic. Um, I'm about, I hope, fingers crossed, I've just done a second audition for a Blackstone book that I hope I get that would, again, that would do it for me. Um, and what else have I got coming up? Oh, yeah, I've got a Sherlock Holmes coming up. And that's another. Book. Oh, so actually, yeah. that's a that's a big piece of advice I would give to people. When you start getting a little bit busier, don't don't stack them and rack them. Go, oh, no, I'm not available that week. Can I do it the week after? Give yourself a, you know, if, you, if they start, if, the, if you start getting people going, oh, could you audition for this? It's difficult at first because in the end you're going, yeah, but that's, it could end up being a week sat on the Todd mm. doing nothing. Um, but those are the gambles that you have to take to take the next step because you need, you need to say yes to everything is what you need to do. Um, even now, I, I, I struggle to say no. And the ones I've said no to, I've always regretted. 
but sometimes you just can't do it in the time frame they've got and there it is yeah um as someone i think said to me once you promise low deliver high so if you really think you can't do it don't do it but what you can do is say look i can't do it the dates you said but could you give me another four days and then i think i can and then bring it in on their delivery date anyway and they're like thank you so much given what i just thought you know i know you wanted it and then they remember you that you made the effort but they also remember that you were organized organized enough to say i'm not sure i can do that mm. so they know from then on the date he gives will be the date we get it if not before so yes. then you're earning a reputation for and then you get more offers i i'm pretty sure that the main in my publisher that gives me the most work if you ask them why they'd say because he hasn't missed a deadline and they've been using me five and a half six years mm. i missed one deadline because in my diary i'd written down the 17th of october and I got a phone call on the 20th of September saying, where is, where's that one? I went, yeah, yeah, it's in the diary. It's all prepped. I went, no, 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 it was due last week. I'd put it in the wrong month. And we were, in, I think that was, I got the email on the Sunday night or something. We're moving house the next Friday. The house is packed up. I'm recording in a studio in town and we're pulling our hair out with it. And I, and I got it to them in four days. It was a 10 hour book. Wow. Um, in a studio so I was getting up at, I was getting up at like 4 30 in the morning get down the studio set because I had to set up my own setup in the studio mm. record did I do it in two two and a half days I did it I've never recorded wow. so much material in my life and I got an earphones for it <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't <laughs> overthink it I had and I had yeah. done the prep I had done the prep it's prep 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 isn't it it's all about yeah. prep and again that 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 work I think if they'd said to me it's due and I hadn't read it yeah. I'd have been in the deep brown stuff and yeah. that would have been awful. Do you often prep books that far ahead of time then? Is that just a, I possibly, a if habit? I possibly can, yeah. If I yeah. possibly can. I, for me, and I know there are some people it works for and some it doesn't. Some people are like, no, I want it fresh in my mind. Hmm. I want it to settle. I have a propensity to overwork. I have a, my characters get quite big hmm. um, and the more the more in advance i read the more it settles and the more realistic they be, the characters become and that's that's me others would say no i need i need them to be fresh and vivid in my brain <laughs> if they're too vivid in my brain you're just getting you know i've been i've got my fans on audible and on amazon and i've got my detractors uh, you know so i have my style but i i know my propensity is to overwork I want to do the work. I want it to be accurate and I want it to be truthful. And there's something about at least a month of it settling in your mind. I never forget the book. And I, mm. you just start bringing your, your outside world and your real life, whatever it is, yeah. whether it's a fantasy. I've done, I've got a couple of series of um, uh, young adult fantasies, which I, I love reading those magic and, you know, all sorts of stuff <clears throat> and beasts and things and strange characters and when you read the book, it's very easy to caricature or over characterize mm. um, them. And that's very dull. And then you go away. And what happens is you, for, you forget those vivid descriptions and you, you hold on to the, the personality that was there. But you also hold on to the style of the book and the writing. And it, it all just kind of, I guess it's like, here we go analogies it's like the dough rising isn't it there's no good sticking the dough straight in the oven let yeah. it rise and become what it needs to be before you cook it oh i like that that oh, is good oh oh i'm having that <laughs> yeah 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 so yes so i like to make the dough yes yeah. <laughs> and let it rise for a month and then it's lovely and soft with a nice crispy crust um yeah, the, yeah, i like that too far. <laughs> no no i like it a lot when um when creating distinctive voices for characters and such, is there anywhere specific that you you draw upon for this? Are you a type of person who like out in life will hear an interesting voice and think, oh, that's going in the bank. I'm having that. Or does it just, you know, just come up from, you know, yourself? Or All of the above. All of the above. I I get a lot of kind of, I guess, what you would call Regency romance, um, mm -hmm. maybe of a little bit more racy nature under a different name. And a, a lot of quite posh men. And they're always low voiced, 
and they you I, I i do struggle when i get another one of those i've just done a series and you do struggle because you you're i'm being employed because of what i did before i know that i know that 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 publisher are like oh we like what matt does with those books and i'm like yeah yeah yeah, but I, it's not the same book every time and yeah and it's, it is difficult it's really difficult to go well this is a different character a different mm. personality and sometimes those books don't describe you don't get a paragraph saying who that person is you've got to discern it from what they do and how they are during the book and it's if you do hear I've got my habits I've got my vocal habits and those voices that and I hate what using the word voices they're characters but there will be characters whom I give voice to and I'm like that's just the same as so and so and or you listen, you're you're speaking it and thinking, but I can't hear the difference. But so if I do hear something like a bloody hell, that's mm. a very useful voice, and it's a and it's a real person, then yeah, I will bank it. I might just drop a little sample on my phone. Not often. Mostly, I like to think I can suss it from the book. Yeah, mostly. I would say 99% of the time, it's in the book. It's telling you what to do. Mm. And sometimes that's difficult too. One of one of about 30 characters had a description, and, and it was a different version of, they had a voice like a boulder rolling down a mountainside. Well, I'm in my, in my mind, it's got to be a boulder rolling down it. And, and yeah. a, along with everything else, that it's this huge um, uh, demonic beast, you're kind of pil you're, you're painting a very vivid, mm. uh, simplistic picture. And and then when the, you know, and if you get all these descriptions, his voice was, it was painful to listen to. I had one, well, it's the same book, and boulders and a voice like a, a blade being dragged along stone. And you put that together and I don't know what else you come up with, but something like this. And then you're like, Jesus, Lord, no one's going to want to listen to that for 10 hours. So then you've got to put into the equation listening to it for 10 hours. I had a proofer recently say to me, oh, I love that book. It gave me a sore throat listening to that character. And I was like, oh, yeah, oh, OK, I've gone. And OK, she she's the proofer. She's used to hearing things and probably enjoyed it for the enjoyment's sake and what she does. I am now thinking I might have made a wrong decision there. If that's what if that her automatic. Oh, what fun. Yeah, yeah it gave me a sore throat even to listen to it. I think, therefore, someone listening to it will think, oh, my God, no, that makes me feel uncomfortable. And when she mm. wrote that, it made me think of, I went to see, I love, I adore Elvis Costello, but he's got that very throaty, raspy voice. And we went to see him in live once and he just had an infection. And he just couldn't sing. And mm. I couldn't sit there and watch him. I thought, you're tearing your vocal cords apart. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. And I did think, hmm maybe i've just done that and there's another book in the series coming up and i think i will you you can find a way to to pull back on a character and just sit on it and you know if you have to maybe infuse that character with maybe they're a bit more relaxed now so therefore um it's still got to be true to the book but yeah i wonder if i made a wrong decision that's done mm. it's out there it's nothing i can do about it now yeah except for tell myself reminder stop being so bloody egotistical and clever it ain't about my clever voices it's not yeah. but we all do it of course uh, but you but that's where that's where the discipline and the, that's where the joy comes in when you get it right and you're sitting in your booth and go oh hang on no 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 one's good no one can listen to this this is just a nightmare to listen to even though the author has said it's like a blade being scratched down a boulder okay well i've got to find a way that that happens combined with the character without it being difficult to listen to. Now, if it's a character in one chapter for a few paragraphs, go for it, you know, bring it on. But if you've got a character that built up from a very small part in the first book, as I did with this one, a bigger part in this book, and now I'm just suddenly thinking, oh, dear Lord, I got a nasty suspicion this comes back quite hugely in the next book. But I didn't know the I haven't had the book, you know, and I haven't yeah. seen, but now I'm beginning to see where the plot is going. 
I've made a difficult decision for myself and listeners. And I think there's going to have to be a way just to modify that, just to bring it down and make it so that it's the same character, but it's, you know, do I back off from the mic? Do I just reduce something? I've got to find a way. I don't know. Would you, is is it a case of subtly, you know, as you know, if so that recurring character through that book, just subtly sort of backing off during, or do you, do you just start the book with, you know, this, you know, quite unquote improved version of that voice. I would start the no. There's interesting question. Oh, good question. How would I do that? I would, in much the same way as when you're doing. If I, I still do, and I like to do independent publishers and books on ACX because I have to edit myself. Mm. It's the most painful process, and I hate it. But it's brilliant to do. One of the best ways, you know, is three weeks later, you've had a cold. Your voice is in a different place, but you've got, you've got a deadline. Sometimes the best thing to do, therefore, is to take that character to a slightly different place so that what you're popping in isn't going to match because they got feistier, they got slower, they got quieter, they got louder. Something that the ear will accept, even though your voice isn't quite where it was when you recorded it you've got to fool the listener's ear into right it's the same character but if he's been talking quite forcefully and then you come back and quite forcefully it's like that just because it is i'm over, i'm massively exaggerating it then what if he's talking quite forcefully but actually i'm gonna come i'm gonna want you know bring yeah. in that thing and your ear will go oh right he's gone quiet and the ear is going it's gone quiet not oh his voice has gone to a different place because he's had a cold yeah so yeah, yeah. in the same way as that quite often works I would probably start the voice better placed, easier to listen to, and allow it to drift to that other place every now and then as if he's got angst. So if if, yeah. if in the first scene that voice started a little bit more like this, and I go slower, and make him give that character, if the scene allows it, some intensity that would make it easier to listen to, and then allow it to explode out. So it's and yeah. they go, oh, that's the character. And so that I think that's the way I would do it. But you've got to make it work. Yeah. And I, and I had one where it was a dra- it was a dragon one, and I it was it was book seven. The book seven hadn't even been written when I recorded book one. It hadn't even been envisaged. Mm. And there had been a character who did have a voice that gave me a sore throat. And I think the author liked it, so wrote a book with that character being the lead character. I hope sells all right. I think it does as well as the other books. I, yeah. I can't listen to it. <laughs> it gives me a sore throat. <laughs> it's different. Yeah. But we got to, you, you know, it's a tough old, it's it's tough and you then feel guilty. I mean, you get offered a book and you don't realise, you know, one of the main characters who wasn't there in your audition is South African and it's the one accent you can't do and they didn't ask you if you could do it and there it is. Mm. And you can't... I guess one you get away with it once you go back to the publisher and say I'm not I'm going to be letting the author down with this and they may go okay fine brilliant we've got time but I have had a situation where I had a book with an accent when I said I don't think this is fair on the author and they went no it's fine use your English mm. voice for the narrative and just use that accent for the for the, those bits and I was like okay and then I wasn't I wasn't I wasn't pleased for the author. I did my best and I and 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 I don't mind listening to it, but I know it's not it isn't what they intended. There were very specific regional accents, mm. um town town specific um of a certain country, which makes a difference. Mm. I think that's a shame. But that this industry is moving incredibly fast. And I think that's part and parcel of going back to where we started when we were talking about training possibly or do you coach or do you do this is we all need to be on our metal we all Mm. need to be constantly trying to keep our blades sharp i mean you know the whole ai conversation starts coming in and i'm not really afraid of that but that's because i'm nearly 60 and i think i've got a good 10 years before it's going to actually take my job away from me if ever Mm. just I just don't see AI doing a voice that gives someone a sore throat. And, and in mm. fact, you know, having just made, given you a whole diatribe about, I think I should have to modify that, AI ain't going to do that. And that's what's yeah. going to make audiobooks interesting. You know, if you say to me today, well, what do we do about AI? What mm. I say is, you do good work, 
you'll get more work. Yeah. You keep yourself sharp, you'll get more work. AI has got its place. AI might even have its place for us. What if you've done a, a 40 hour book? It's been proofed by Positron. So you get 378 corrections back, most of which aren't corrections, but you don't know and you've got to go through them all. Yeah. So what if they get their Positron corrections, they sample the voices you used in the on that book, and then they AI your corrections. We never get corrections again. Now, there's a possibility there that that could benefit us. Mm. You never get corrections again. You don't have to put a day in for sorting out that. You don't. You, you just send the book. Mm. Example that book. They correct your corrections, your, your mistakes from that book. Off done, bong. Mm. The trouble is, it's trust, isn't it? It's trust yeah. between us and those companies who want to use AI and mm. are sampling. I mean, I had, I was approached by an AI company um, several years ago, myself and another reader, uh, she for the female voice and me for the male voice. And I remember at the time she said, oh, they're offering such and such. And I said, but that's not as much as even reading a book. Mm. They were basing it on UK fees, not American fees. And they were saying, they're going to give you this much money. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Because she was like, shall I do it? I said, oh, well, stop right there. You're licensing your voice. So yeah. I would say, no, I want payment each year based on what I would record each year. And I want that license reviewed every 10 years. And I want this and I want that. And I was like, you can't this. And, it, and in fact, I said, to her, I don't think we should be doing this. This is mm. we're we're not selling our voice. We're selling our career. We're selling our industry. And there are yeah. people we all have our own reasons and 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 some of them are genuinely good reasons um mostly i would say for crying out loud guys we look, even if you're not getting much work you're selling the industry down the path mm -hmm. if you go down the river if if you do if you license your voice if you give any sort of positive um sort of noise to the ai half of the audiobook industry it has its place and maybe it has its place to help us to support us maybe it has its place in medical books that nobody wants to read nobody can read but there are people who are very good at that who probably make that interesting that ai mm. won't but then the publishers make oh, i don't want it to be interesting i want it to be plain speak simple and all of that we're not going to stop it ever mm. certainly not in this country with with employment laws as they are so we must find a way of being better than it i think it's a really productive way of thinking about it um and um it sort of it takes back a little bit of control you think okay well i'm gonna um be reflective of that i'm gonna be i'm gonna give the best and i'm gonna give the publishers or you know the companies that are producing these uh audiobooks the you know the, i'm gonna give them a reason to to hire a human well, I mean, I, I don't, you may cut this out, but I can tell AI to fuck off far more ways than AI can tell me to fuck off. Yeah. And that's the end of it. That's just the truth. I can do it uh, infinite ways. And I guess if I just do the tweak on the date and the thing with AI, no, you can't. You can't. You can't because each tweak only had, there's no infinity there. There's infinity yeah. there. Yeah. And we, we, we have to believe in our humanity, in our humanness, and mm. that that will survive because it will because yeah. it, it has in every other area of life ai has its uses but it's not going to destroy us if we don't allow it and if we remain better than it going on to something a little bit different the actor's life a creative's life can often include times of great uncertainty um, whether it's uh, not knowing where you're going to be working after a project is wrapped or whether it's in between projects um, this can be quite lonely and, and it can be quite challenging times have you um, any methods or tips to, to help those who are dealing with this side of, of the lifestyle you know it is it's horrible it's the worst it's the worst worst feeling you no, I was going to say the worst feeling is finishing a job and not having one to go to. No, it isn't. The worst feeling is not having had a job for six months, a year. Mm. And I've, I've been there. And it's it's really, really difficult. And my only advice is do not sit in your house 
staring at your navel going i'm awful i'm obviously crap that there, there is no way but madness down that road get out there and work in a pub get out there and work in a restaurant dear lord my restaurant and catering career is bigger than my acting career ever was and it saved me from all of that because mostly there's other people there going through the same thing for a start you keep busy i mean wow at the moment you can get a job in almost any restaurant you want and it's not fun and i hate being a waiter but i hated not being anything else even mm. more it's there is nothing there is nothing positive about sitting at home on your own feeling miserable being miserable being lonely being poor again we all have our own way and it's a mm. you have to deal with it how you deal with it but if any young actor said to me what do i do i'd say <laughs> learn how to read audiobooks <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. It's it's this still expanding industry. Um, I I li literally give that advice to every young actor I meet for crying out loud, get out there, buy us. You know, that's my road NT one that I had um, on the first. Ooh, I need to do that on the first ever books I I recorded. Now I've got a nice expensive mic in there that isn't that much better, but you know, it makes yeah. me feel better. It's ego again, isn't it? <laughs> um, so uh, advice to people feeling lonely and and you know useless and unloved and never going to work again is what well, you are but it's this is this is the career you've chosen it's testing mm. and get get through it the way you have to and mostly you have to get through it by paying your bills and we're we're, we're going to be in tough times some people are going to really really I, I can't let's not get into politics as such but if you're an actor you have personality, you have a, an intellect that would be the envy of most. Get out there and use it to keep socially mixing with other human beings. We need human beings. It's the hardest thing about being a narrator. There's no other human mm. being in there and it's really tough. The harder than that is being unemployed and sitting on your own. You know, harder than that is my 83 year old mum during lockdown, literally sitting on her own. Mm thinking I don't want to live anymore you know sometimes schadenfreude is a great healer you know I'm not as bad as them I'm not as bad as them and it, it does help but I think just get outside that house that flat that place you live mm -hmm. and go and be with people and if that means you get home absolutely exhausted and fed up at the end of the night I bet you're less fed up than if you just sat and watched daytime tv and didn't do anything mm -hmm. Um, another thing I would say is you get your diary out and every single day for the next two months, you put something in your diary, something, one little thing every single day. I'm going to do something constructive, whether it's read a play. Oh, I read a play. I know a bit more about the industry, whether it's go on to Mandy.com and have a little look at what's casting, go on to Spotlight, have a little look what's casting. I'm going to go to the gym today because I'm going to keep myself fit. I'm going to do a yoga lesson. I'm going to keep myself able to move about anything small oh i'm you know I, i'm I, is it i need a i need an audition outfit and i got a little bit of money from my parents to something every single day try and find something positive constructive that you can say yep i've done something constructive because if you're sitting on your bum doing nothing nothing's going to happen mm. that's the end of it yeah nothing is going to happen sitting on your own in the house yeah. and that's the hardest it's a hard lesson and i i struggled with it and again that was my generation we weren't taught get up get out there chase the work and they say it's my generation maybe it's just me i don't know it could just be me i'm i could just be lazy it could be that um yeah. it's difficult isn't it what what advice do you give to people yeah. not working it's get out and get any job any job is experience as well i think you're absolutely right i think you're absolutely right um i think you know for those times like when um i was trying to get my narration things kicked off and things and you know my my um my sort of education sort of tended to lead towards trades and getting people into trades and that's all big around here 
um, about where I live and I wasn't really that interested in that. So when they were all going off and getting apprenticeships and then graduating those apprenticeships and then I was es essentially starting out with nothing and things, that was that was an incredibly tough time. And you kind of, um, yeah, you sort of think, what have I done? I've just ruined my, <laughs> ruined my life. Of course, it's not the case. Oh, and of course, what I mean, what a lot of youngsters, I, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of youngsters, I think that that there's that is the hardest time um, mm. because you haven't had time to absorb what it is your life is. But they're getting degrees now. You come out of if you go to drama school, you, you know, and I'm talking specifically about those or, the, or you've been to university, you've got a degree. If you've got a degree, you can do a teaching course. All right. Sod it. It might mean taking a little extra time out, get yourself um, that extra qualification and go and be a go and be a, a, a fill-in teacher the, the, yeah. the, the, you know yeah there are jobs out there that the, the, the training uh, this is another thing I learned from doing my my master's in directing was just being in a drama school again and watching how young actors are trained now it's astonishing it's I take my hats off to them I thought we worked hard we know nothing what they do at drama school now is extraordinary and they come out so qualified for so many things but don't let go of it it's yeah. so easy to let go um use it if it means all right well i'm gonna i i'm so fit and i'm so you know i know about my body all right i'll go and do a personal training i'll go do this i do keep active it's yeah yeah i mean that's I'm, I've got an 11 year old in a few years time I'm going to have a teenager and I'm going to be trying to say that to her and she's going to tell me where to get off dad you know so it's it's so easy to say get out and get off yeah the that's no it's a not it's a harder thing to do it's really difficult and it's yeah um but the more people who tell you maybe you know there's another person here on another podcast saying guys some somehow it has to come from within you and if it's the passion that you have for what you do that says all right i can't do it unless i get out what can i do what what have i got what energy have i got what could i do and then try and find a way in your mind of saying that is i can use that positively for what i want to do mm. you know none of us get to do what we want to do all the time so find something you can do that will pay those bills and use it to get what you want so yeah again back to being a waiter communication um stamina i mean all of those things i've met directors i got an audition um out of working in a restaurant on the beach in brighton um with a very 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 well-known director i'd been told um i won't give his name because the story i've been told oh god this is god table such and such he's so rude i just don't know how i'll serve him and i looked over jesus christ i'll serve him very famous director so and he was being rude but i just I thought right and i just gave him quips and we laughed about well, i was about 15 years older than any of the other <laughs> of the other waiters and at the end of it he goes you're an actor aren't you i went yeah because you had to be you had to be an actor I said here's my card i said I don't need your card i know who you are because yeah no but there's my phone number i'm casting for a show in a couple of weeks i'd love you to come and see me nice you wow don't, yeah i don't know i my attitude a kind of kind of still to this day is everything is an audition yeah everything yeah you know when i go to apac and i meet people of course they're going to listen to you, your voice and how you speak and my voice is english what they want to hear is me being quite english i can get quite i can get quite history i can get very lazy when i go to america i become a little bit more clipped and a little bit more precise because i know that's what work uh, quite often <clears throat> excuse me that's the work i get and they're more likely to remember my englishness than they are that i'm five foot eight and kind of a you know normal looking bloke they're not going to remember that. They might remember my Englishness. So what are the what are people going to remember about you? I get recognised around town by people who may have seen me before because I got glasses now. No one ever recognised me before, so I keep wearing glasses. That's everything's an audition. Yeah. Yeah. That's you know, but that's that's the old actor's paranoia, isn't it? But you know, I don't think that ever goes away. It never <laughs> goes away. I mean, I promise you this recording this morning it's like no 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 i haven't got it right i'll never get this book three times scrap it start again 
yeah. we're all we're all judging ourselves do all you, the time do you think you have to be like that to in order to to keep on your metal to keep to, to in order to keep it fresh to keep you um you know pushing those boundaries do you, do you think you have to be a little bit no i don't i th i think again it goes back there's been conversation i brought up the coaching thing earlier because there had been a conversation on facebook at, someone on one of the social platforms had said coaching for narrators was a ripoff and someone else was like oh don't be ridiculous and then this argument started and it got quite feisty and then another a dear friend of mine uh, who i hugely respect and he's an author as well and he wrote this little essay actually about it in, in which boiled down to you do what you need to do mm. you read how you need to read that's your label that's your brand so you do what you need to do to keep yourself sane to keep yourself sharp if you need to coach if you need to train if you need to go and uh read out loud to someone else every now and then just to sharpen things up brilliant at the moment i'm doing there's a it's a, a bbc website called maestro and they've got all these courses on and, and they're mm. free and it's like so i'm doing a writer's course i'm not going to write in it i'm literally it's brian moore talking about how authors should think and I'm like, this is fascinating for an yeah. audiobook narrator to and I thought yeah because I always harp on about <laughs> interpreting the author's words I thought well I want to hear how authors think and it's I'm finding it fascinating yeah. um that's what I'm doing and that, again that's me saying well what, do I, what have I done positively positively um <laughs> constructively for my career it's not just enough just to sit in there and read I want to mm. I want to I, I, no secret, I've got an ego. <laughs> I think that's out there. Um, and I want to be thought of as good at what I do. Of course. Because apart from anything else, I'll get more work. And so I can't, I can't know if just being me is enough. Mm. And I suspect it's not. That's, that's my attitude. And I suspect if I listen to others, my way of doing that is I've got a course called 21 Targets and I have 15 people. And one of the parts of that is we all listen, they all listen to each other and they have to comment on each other. So I'm listening to all these different readers doing the same pieces. And it's fascinating yeah. how many different versions you get. And that be me that I'm getting as much training as the people who come and do the course because I'm doing the same as them. And then I'm listening to Brian Moore talking about how he approaches his ideas and what you do with a book and how you write it and how you create those worlds and all of this. And I'm like, wow. I've got to interpret what other people do. So that's, yeah. again, feeding, feeding my mind. And, you know, and then probably I get overzealous about it. And then I'll probably overcolor in the characters and go, whoa, read this book six weeks ahead and let it sit, yeah. you know, and and it's being self-aware and knowing knowing yourself. It's, um you know, when you read an audio book, yes, you're interpreting that person's words, but it's an awful lot of your personality goes into it because yeah. it's how you interpret those words so whilst the author is important you give a book to 10 people you're going to get 10 different audio books and that's exactly yeah. how it should be absolutely i'm gonna to have to check out that maestro course because i've done um i've had a look at a, quite a few um masterclass courses you know the um the i think it's an american company but they have like david sedaris oh yeah, yeah 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 yeah. but you have yeah. to join the, th the whole thing yeah, yeah. one well, like, there are, i know there's a couple i thought i want to do that yeah i've done that i signed up to the um i signed up to their uh you know where you can get it all and you pay like a, a yearly subscription to it and i remember watching david sedaris's one and I wasn't familiar with him before watching his content. I was just blown away by the way that he thinks about the world. And, you know, through the, in his diaries and such. And he just looks at it, like, even the most smallest nuanced things. And he turns that into a story and shows you how to think like a like an author, think like a writer. And that I got, I had so much, you know, not necessarily that I was going to start writing content like he was. Um, but he just... Yeah, it just sort of did something to my brain and, and the way that I thought about it. It was a yeah, yeah. I, I really read I, BBC I Maestro. BBC Maestro. It sounds like I'm getting a similar thing because I I've yeah. only watched a couple and I'm like fascinated to hear Alan Moore, who I have not read Jerusalem, but I know it's one of the most complex and difficult books. Yeah. Just to hear him talking in really simple terms about storytelling. I think it's just called. I think the course is storytelling, yeah. and I just find it fascinating absolutely fascinating because 
I can't write. I, I, you know, some of the stuff I've read, I, I say to friends, oh, this is the worst book I've ever read. And they're like, oh, it's always safe, but I can't write a sentence. So it's still better than anything I could do. And that's where you've yeah. got to hold on to the respect for what's on the page <laughs> in front of you. Because, of course, it's difficult. I like reading that. Other people like reading that. I have to read what I'm given. That's what mm. being professional is all about, you know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, um, I think it's really fascinating to just diversify what you, what you, what you, um, you know, what you're watching, what you're listening to, and things, especially as a as a narrator and a performer. I would, um, I'd love to, if we do have the time, if that's okay, I would love to talk to you about Lunatics and the Poor. Would, <laughs> would you, you be able to tell us a little bit about how this company came about and your your experience as a, as as an artistic director? Uh, I can. I can tell you almost exactly how the company came about. I was a waiter at one of the um, people in the UK will know of the the Soho House Company, the big mm. company of clubs and restaurants and nightclubs. And I worked at one of their um, uh, venues called The Electric on Portobello Road. And I was on I was on the club. I was like late night, you know, registration, people coming in. No, you, you, you're not on the list. Literally, <laughs> you're not on the list. That was me. Nice. And then there's a cinema connected and the guy, you're not on the list there, was an actor as well. And we became chums and he he wanted to produce and wanted to do some things on the fringe. And after a while of knowing me, he said, Matt, I think you'd be great to direct. So it, I hadn't done my directing course then. I hadn't really thought about it. And we started chatting about possible plays and doing blah, blah, blah. And he said, I've got this play I really want to do. And it's called the, it's, it's, the, it's the reindeer monologues. I can't remember the, is it the eight reindeer monologues? So it's Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, da, 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 da. yeah, the eight reindeer monologues. And it's one of the most offensive plays I've ever written, read um, in, in that it takes those loved and, and, and revered and, you know, um, it's lovely cuddly characters and puts them in a whole different light and he said I think you could direct this so he he started producing it and I was like oh okay oh that's me in the deep thing I wanted we we had the I could probably find it on my computer somewhere if I bothered to search we had you know the the, the company's what 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 was our company about and it was about vivid in your face theatre it was what made me think I want to do this I want to do this I want to do this but it's it's uh, it, it, producing fringe. We did it on the fringe, sort of, you know, yeah. in London, and it's it, dear lord. It is like having your head smashed in with a cricket bat ten times a day because every time you try to do something, mm. it's going to cost ten times what you thought. Someone's going to say no. There's going to be rules and regulations about why you can't do it the way you wanted to do it, and it's really difficult. And I, you know, having complained about casting creatives i do i take my hat off to producers it's tough producing is very difficult and but it was so satisfying to get that play up running on reviewed the actors loved being in it we had a an absolute blast producing it and mm. it's as a company it we i've done a couple of things and used that moniker just to say, you know, there's someone using it, but it didn't really last. What it did lead to was because I was living in Brighton at the time and I felt like, um, what a strange town. It's so full of theatre people, actors, producers, technicians, and we've got a touring theatre. We've got a little fringe studio theatre for touring fringe studio things, but we don't have our own rep. How does that work? Chichester has got its own rep. Chichester's like a big posh village, you know. I'm like, so for Brighton Fringe one year, we set up Brighton Rep Theatre, but I, I was kind of taking all the energy that I had sort of discovered from Lunatics and the Poor to do that. So we then, I wanted Vivid In Your Face Theatre, so we were using, we did, um, we had a kids show that I didn't produce, that someone else did as part of it. We uh, What was the other one we had? Um, we lost one show because they got work two of the actors in it got work at the complete wrong moment we couldn't do it but we did bash neil the butte um which won an argus angel in that particular festival and it was like it just led on to me going i love i love i love actors i love theater there's no better place in the world than a theater and when we got the pub where we wanted to do it and we said they said right how how often how much of the venue space do you want we said all of it so what do you mean? We want it for the whole, we want the whole, we had it for the whole fringe. No one else performed there. It was ours. We did rep. We we got, we had other companies come in that we produced and put and, and made a little program. 
and and it really it got so much interest and it was lovely but there's just the you know i think one of the other taglines was you've got to be lunatic to try and produce theater in this day and age because i think that was around the time just just literally months after the credit crash the credit mm. crunch and all of that all that you know, everything going bonkers and we were like we still want to do this and it hasn't really got that much easier since mm. it's um a very difficult task but it can be very rewarding um and it's one i i miss it hugely but i've kind of realized if, if i want the life i want for my daughter especially um then this is my home now mm. this is where i i'm i'm very very lucky just bonkers lucky I, t- I can't believe it sometimes that all those different strands of my little odd brain seem to click together in there mm-hmm. and it is a it's you know it is an odd brain I'm an argumentative arrogant egotistical actor I am and I've had so much trouble with directors and who knows what in the past I don't get that in there because it's only yeah. me and and it's the place where I am actually at peace because I can focus all of that belief in storytelling and, and what I believe it should be in in one direction with no one telling me I'm wrong except for the public who then don't buy the book or slag me off and you take it on board and you move forward and go, oh, I made a bad error. I made a voice that gave him a sore throat or whatever. Yeah. And it's just, I, I, I'm a very lucky man. I'm a very lucky man. That was fascinating, though, about about your time producing shows and putting it on and things. I'm, I'm fascinated with that whole world myself. And it's, it's the most satisfying. It is wonderful, but it's yeah. tough. It's hard. Yeah. It's very hard. Yeah. I'm not a salesman. That's what I've never been. I'm not a salesman. You've got to be a salesman. You've got to be. Um, that wonderful personality on show able to say at all times you want to buy into this because mm. and i you've heard me today i i can get quite in, you know get a bit like mm, shut up you know and i know it i know but that's me and i can't be anything else <laughs> it's been such a pleasure to uh to to talk to you um we do have time just for one more question if that's okay and just just to just to finish us off is there any upcoming projects anything approaching the diary that you're excited about that we could perhaps look forward to oh do you know what there's a non-fiction coming out that i just read and it's it's a the subject matter which i found fascinating the it's it's one of those non-fictions when people say and you've had you've had Johnny Heller on with you, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you have you had Sean Allen Pratt yet? Yeah, he was. Yeah, just just give me the full set. Yeah, <laughs> they, they'll they'll always argue with each other. They're like they're a bit of a double act where you know Johnny's like, yeah, you can do nonfiction like this, uh, and and Sean's like, no, you can't. You have to do it like that. And I think this nonfiction book is where Johnny Heller meets Sean Allen Pratt because it's it's written by an author who uh, who's got let's say a few chips on his shoulder. And I don't mm. say that as an insult. He's he he's absolutely telling his industry what he thinks of it. Yeah. And it is so laden with not even laden, written with sarcasm and an attitude toward the industry that he has an attitude toward. It was so much fun to read because he's just basically slagging off the pharmaceutical industry and other doctors who don't believe what he thinks. And anybody who's laid down all these medical and health diktats in the past yeah. and it was just so much fun to read because it's that thing that we, that I agree with Johnny it's you know, it's a character study in one book don't tell me there isn't character work in that book it's brilliant it's called The Clot Thickens mm-hmm. by I can't remember his first name is uh, Dr Kendrick um, and it's about basically about how it isn't fat that gives us heart disease. It's carbohydrates and sugar, which I think the world is coming around to. But it's sort yeah. of about his struggle as one of the early proponents of that and how industry and money and big pharma pushed and pushed and pushed. And yeah. it's, a, it's a really oh, I'm surprised that that's the one that's standing out. But it is. It's a, a fascinating read. Um, and it's one there aren't many What when I really, 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 really. I'm good at English, aren't I? Really, really, really. Like a book I've read, I'll buy the print version. I'm getting the print version of that. Another one I think people should listen to 
um, my favourite for years is The Orphanage by Zahi Jadam. I don't know if I've said that right. I should know by now. And it's the it's a, it's a, it's a translation. He's the, he's one of the major Ukrainian poets, and he's he wrote it about the Ukraine war when Russia invaded Crimea. But it's it's the same war. It's the same war, and it's it's just this very simple journey that this man takes to get his nephew from an orphanage to the other side of the town. And it is just so laden. There's no, nothing horrific happens in it. But the prose are, well, they, they're, they're almost poetry. Some of it's beautiful. And it's a translation. The two guys who translated it, I think, did an amazing job. Um, and it's just laced with fear and uncomfortable situations that, and uncomfortable questions that I think are so important to what's going on over there. And, and consequently, what's going on around us and has been for the last two or three years yeah. in terms of do you make a choice or do you stand on the sidelines and watch those choices being made for you and then complain about them and um, mm -hmm. so that's yeah yeah the orphanage by Zahi Shadan that's out and I love it and the clock thickens it couldn't be more different um, yeah. by Dr Malcolm Kendrick yeah yeah brilliant well both of those picks sound absolutely fantastic um, and definitely both up my street. I'd love a, I love a Saki medical nonfiction. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a whole genre yeah. now? Saki medical nonfiction. <laughs> yeah, get me, get me on that. <laughs> That's that sounds wonderful. So that just about does it for this episode of the Audiobook Club. All of the relevant links to social media accounts and websites uh, will be linked in the description. Um, thank you so much for making us a part of your day and another. Huge